monetization is an incredibly hot topic in esports these days. People are consistently talking about, okay, what's the best method to monetize? Is it possible to monetize? And people are always saying that, hey, esports people are making a loss, be it tournament organizers, be it teams, be it basically anyone except for the developers, they're going to be making a loss. Now, this is a video that will cater to a lot of different esports. This is a video talking about Counter-Strike, League of Legends, and Dota primarily, maybe a few others as well, not Overwatch League since that's a very different model. Now, where I'm talking about monetization, I'm going to be discussing it on the basis of a couple of things. First, we need to know what the current assumptions are. The current assumptions from people are uh, based off of a new zoo report, which is a data analytics company um, that specializes in esports market data collection. This report was done in 2017, and uh, the free report basically read that $3.64 dollars uh, is the average amount that an esports enthusiast spends per year as of 2017. And the prediction was that in 2020, this would rise to $5.20. Now, this is a very interesting um, particular statistic because it's very misleading. On one end, it seems incredibly low, especially when you compare it to the statistics of how much people spend in sports like basketball, where it's $15 a year on average. Um, but if you actually look into this in more detail, if you read the report, it becomes even more tragic, which is if you read the report, it says that this includes all revenue streams, which means that this includes things like sponsorships as well. So this isn't just that you as an individual person who is an esports fan is actually spending $3.64 on yourself. This is actually saying that all the sponsorship money that's coming in, everything that's coming in, even including developers may potentially earning because they haven't explained this in the methodology, but potentially even including what developers earn from things like compendiums and things like League of Legends skins and stickers and CSGO. So if you actually look at what the direct spending is, and direct spending categorizes three things, which is merchandise, tickets, or subscriptions, it was 33 cents in 2017. And by 2020, it is expected to rise to 47 cents. So that's the assumption that I'm going to be working on the basis of that this is what we go with because this is industry standard. Now, this is really, really scary immediately because you're looking at 47 uh, cents being spent by an individual on things like tickets, subscriptions, and merchandising. So individuals aren't really spending anything. So when we say that you're getting a free product and everyone seems to very quickly say, hey, who cares, three and a half dollars being spent may not seem like much, but at least we're giving our eyeballs that are being monetized. But actually, this money includes eyeball monetization. So if you look over towards direct spending um, and the correlation, a lot of myths that are up there in esports and in the esports public, even though I'm sure people at the back end of esports understand this, they're very easily disproven. <coughs> The first one is regarding pay-per-view. And this, (coughs) pardon me. (coughs) And this myth is a hot topic in uh, Counter-Strike in particular, sometimes in Dota as well. And to a lesser extent in League of Legends, because that's a bit more developer controlled. The pay-per-view myth is that if tournament organizers or developers switch to pay-per-view, you're going to lose so much viewership that it's not going to matter um, how much money you're getting from pay-per-view because sponsorships are going to decrease. Let's assume for a second that your sponsorships go down to completely zero dollars. If that's the case, then to compensate for that, all you need for pay-per-view right now, considering the statistics, and obviously, please keep in mind, this will vary from esport to esport, Uh, But considering the statistics that on average $5.20 are being spent by uh, fans per year, all you need to do is have one out of 11 fans literally buy a year-long pass for $5.50 and you're still going to be making more money from pay-per-view than you would be from sponsorships. And this is assuming sponsorships go down to absolutely nothing. So this notion that pay-per-view would be unprofitable is really, really bizarre when you actually look down at the numbers, because this is the very best case scenario uh, for the argument that they're trying to build. Because here's the thing, this is another myth which is absolutely false that sponsorships would fall down. Why is that? It's because Sponsors who are smart, and now we are getting more and more sponsorships who are coming into this, who understand how esports is kind of working, at least on consumer side. Sponsors who are smart will realize 
that you as a consumer are not spending money. You as a consumer are not purchasing anything in esports, so your level of investment is only dictated by how much you're watching, but not how much you're spending. So you are automatically a less valuable consumer to that sponsor. Anyone who's watching on a pay-per-view broadcast is more committed to that broadcast. And ergo, you can actually sell sponsors for higher values, as in higher values per person. Yes, you're probably going to get less of a sponsorship amount overall. But like I said, a $5.50 year-long pass is still going to be making you more, more money than actual sponsorships. So then the question obviously comes in, hey, these tournament organizers aren't stupid. Why didn't they just switch to pay-per-view if that was the case? Because let's be honest, if only... Only one out of 11 people need to switch to a $5.50 um, year annual pass. I think every single eSport title is going to be able to fulfill that like that. One out of 11 people is nothing. $5.50 is literally nothing to people like that. So you're probably going to end up making a lot more money. Well, the honest answer to that is they were planning on doing it. Pay-per-view is something that they've been wanting to go to for such a long time. And I can guarantee this. But why haven't they done it so far is because they're trying really hard to treat this as a growth industry where they can keep on growing and then they can eventually switch to pay-per-view when instead of having, you know, a million people who might be tuning in now and then, now you've got 3 million people and now it's not 1 out of 11 of 1 million, it's 1 out of 11 of 3 million because the rate of growth that you're going to have once pay-per-view kicks in is going to be significantly lower than the rate of growth you're going to have when you have free streams and that's something that really needs to be kept in mind that when you're playing for the long con it seems like it's perfectly fine to lose a couple of million dollars now this is still problematic though why because whenever a global recession comes this will collapse whenever problems come this will collapse whenever developers come in and say no this will collapse and we've seen an example of this in recent counter-strike where in counter-strike we've seen that valve has unequivocally maintained their stance while well, counter-strike and dota but who cares about dota realistically um valve has unequivocally maintained their stance by saying that our terms of service are maintained, you are not allowed to put a paywall on any sort of streaming that you're doing. And this is part of Valve's term of services. Riot, of course, runs their own league, so they don't have anything similar, but they've chosen not to go for um, a pay-per-view for reasons that I'll get into in a second. But in CS, Valve's just said, no, you can't have this. So at a point where potentially ESL was thinking about, hey, maybe it's time to actually go in and add pay-per-view, they can't do it anymore because Valve doesn't show any inclination of changing that. So if this ever does change, expect this to go to pay-per-view immediately, regardless of however many people you think they're actually going to end up dropping, because it's very, very easy to make up for the lost sponsorship dollars. Now, the other thing is that, okay, what about Riot and everyone? Why aren't they adding pay-per-view? Well, that's also a pretty straightforward answer, which is that Riot's still making money. Esports is a loss leader for them. So esports gets to maintain the interest within the game to the point where more and more people will keep on coming in and buying skins and spending money on the game itself. So when you're comparing it to something like Counter-Strike, where tournament organizers are independent of the developer, that's a very different scenario. Now, Riot doesn't care if team owners are losing money because team owners are a secondary party in this regard and they'd like it if they made money, but it's not like Riot's going to switch to pay-per-view and reduce their viewership by half and ergo reduce the amount of money people are spending on their game by half as well, if not more, uh, over a sustained period of time. So that's why you're probably not going to be seeing pay-per-view on that end. And that's why pay-per-view... Um, even if it was incredibly profitable, might not be able to come that easily. Do expect this to change over the course of the next few years, though, because eventually this will have to break and pay-per-view will have to come through. Um, maybe not pay-per-view, uh, but an actual season-long pass or something on those lines, where even if you're selling a year-long pass for $10, you're probably going to be having double, triple the amount of revenue that you're having right now immediately just like that. If ESL wanted to do that in Counter-Strike, I can guarantee that they'd probably be able to pull that off if Valve did allow them. Okay, that's the first myth of monetization. The second myth of monetization that I kind of want to talk about is, and this is a big misconception as well, is the monetization of media rights, which is, and this is where I'm going to be referring to Facebook uh, and the deal that ESL struck with them, which was incredibly po unpopular. If any of my viewers are watching from League of Legends point of view, I... Thank you for that. I don't know why you would be. But if you look at the um, numbers again, please keep in mind that 
with how little money ESL and companies like that are actually getting from the consumers, even as far as eyeballs go, remember three and a half dollars a year, very, very little. It is actually pretty profitable to sell media rights off as long as you're getting a similar trade-off. And the similar trade-off is going to be that the media right is going to be bringing you in about, oh, about five and a half dollars a year again per person who would be watching otherwise. And then you reduce it by however much sponsors are going to be willing to stay. Again, sponsors will like the viewers who will shift from Twitch to Facebook more because that indicates and signals a higher level of commitment. Because if you are not willing to switch platforms, you are not that committed to the eSport. If you're not that committed to the eSport, you're less likely to buy their product. You're less likely to support that sponsor because of that relationship you have with the eSport. Thus, it's not actually that bad and sponsors will probably pay more per person, but obviously the amount of money that you're getting from the sponsor is going to be less overall. So media rights, even if people um, don't understand this completely, media rights are this other thing where you overestimate how much sponsorship money is actually bringing in. Finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about monetization of teams and the mates that surround those. Because so far, everything I've said kind of shows that, you know, even if the tournament organizer is making money, team owners are gonna end up being shafted one way or the other lies all lies from a to z i will tell you this right now first of all um my assumptions are going to be based on cloud nine because cloud nine recently released a statement that they said that they're losing between one and two million dollars a year on their counter-strike team and they expect that all of the top 20 counter-strike teams in the world currently are going to be doing like that teams heavily rely on sponsorship revenue uh, which is something that's very clearly indicated that people aren't directly willing to spend because they're spending 47 cents a year as market research is showing you. Now, here's the thing. There's two ways of uh, looking at it this way. The first way is people aren't supporting teams. Uh, one t-shirt sale costs $30. So if a team sells $30, that one person has just paid for 63 other people. So, you know, if not even 2% of your fan base is buying t-shirts, that is kind of shady of them, isn't it? I actually agree with this to some extent, because quite frankly, the level of commitment that some people seem to have in their teams does not really measure up to the level of financial support they're willing to offer. I think that it is it is always a team's responsibility to get you to pay, but there is this entire thing about, hey, you can't really wear a jersey, this, 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 is Merchandise isn't really easy to wear. Okay, here's the thing. The second way of thinking of it is that teams are not making it easy for you to spend money on them. And I completely 100% subscribe to this. And this isn't something we actually see discussed very often. And I don't know why that is. Um, teams in the top 20 of Counter-Strike, some of them don't even have stores. So I looked at, uh, for a store for Heroic right now, which is a smaller Danish organization, but it is about rank 14 or something on those lines, uh, or we at least it was before Fun Plus Phoenix uh, bought them out. They do not have a store online. The only time they have stores is if you go to an ESL event or a DreamHack event, or if you go directly to the ESL gaming, uh, shop.esl gaming website. And even sometimes then you can't really buy jerseys and whatnot for them. This is absurd. This should never even be like, this should never be a thing. You should always have a store. Second thing is, the cheapest thing I could find across a lot of different team stores who did have stores was $12 socks on Cloud9's website. And the only reason why they have those is because Cloud9 has a partnership with Puma and thus they have to have socks because Puma has socks. $12 is an absurdly large amount of money. I don't care what anyone tells me. Most teams have the minimum product being priced at about 25 euros or $30, which again is a lot of money for people to spend in one place. Now, here's what I ask you. Twitch subscriptions cost someone $5 a month. That's so much easier for someone to spend. There is no level of online spending actually available to someone like me who, you know, maybe can't spend $30 a month because I make uh, you know, let's say potentially I make $2,000 a month, I make $1,800 a month, I make t even $3,000 a month, 30 bucks can be a pretty big deal to spend all in one place. Yes, I might be willing to spend $30 over a year. I'm probably going to be, you know, more happier to do that compared to spending $30 in one place. 
so many people I know who are not that um, who, are, who who aren't really doing that well for themselves are still fine of chucking a couple of dollars somewhere. And for a for a service that's purely online and is so heavily dependent on online, I'm sometimes amazed by how little creativity these teams have had as far as actually. Um, creating avenues for people like me and people who are, you know, not whales to spend. Because everything about merchandise is targeted towards whales. Remember, if you're buying 63 people's worth of shit when you're making a $30 purchase, you're a whale at this point. So teams have very much failed to monetize. So you should have sympathy for them because quite frankly, it is a pretty rough place to be, but you should also be thinking, what the hell are you doing? Because there's no reason for you to go subscribe to their Twitch channel. There's no, there's no content for you to get by paying $2. You're not going to be able to get anything special uh, by, you know, chucking a couple of, um, chucking a few dollars at, at a wall. People on Patreon have figured this out. You need to give incentives to people to spend small amounts of money and then a lot of people will do it at the same time. I'll make this a little bit more concrete in numerically, which is what I've been trying to do throughout this video. If you're losing $1.2 million a year on your Counter-Strike lineup and Twitch subscriptions get you $3 a month, you need to have 33,000 people subscribe to you on Twitch across a year. That's not that much especially when you consider that you don't have to necessarily make a profit from Twitch. You don't even have to break even from Twitch. You just have to have a significant revenue stream from it. So if you want to have $400,000 a year being earned, you need around about 10,000, 11,000 subscribers, give or take. And that's purely from Twitch. And I have to give credit to Cloud9. It seems like they are actually going in that direction because uh, they have hired Monty. They are making studios. They're trying to create shows that might be paywalled, and we don't really know about that. But at the very least, they'll give you incentive to spend money on them, to add more content, to make more cool shit for you. Because so far, teams have utterly failed to monetize in ways where they're all looking towards these things about, oh, media rights, oh, exclusivity, oh, franchise leagues, oh, let's get a partnership with ESL, which will be the Louvre Agreement, and then we can dominate the circuit. You cannot monetize your fans effectively because you have not given them the means to do so. That's such an important point. I don't understand how that's been missed for so long. Please, figure your shit out, guys.